Are you crazy enough to homeschool? Some people think homeschoolers are odd and antisocial, that their children live their whole lives in their pajamas and that they have no friends at all. Our guest today, the wise and wonderful Mary Ellen Barrett, will unpack some of the most popular myths about homeschooling, as well as some things that are actually true. This is going to be fun. Stay with us. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. I'm your host, Lisa Maladnik. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking with a good friend of mine from right here on Long Island. We're part of the same Catholic homeschooling network and have known each other for about 10 years. She's also one of my heroes in homeschooling. You've probably heard of her, too, especially if you've been out at the homeschooling conferences. Mary Ellen Barrett is a mother of eight children and wife to David. She is a lifelong New Yorker and an active member of her parish of Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Lindenhurst, New York. Mrs. Barrett is a columnist for the Long Island Catholic, editor of Seton Magazine, and chronicles the journey of living a faithful but imperfect Catholic family life on her weblog, Tales from the Bonnie Blue House. Mary Ellen has had her work published in Faith and Family Magazine, CatholicMom.com, Catholic News Service, Catholic Digest, and was formerly a frequent contributor to CatholicExchange.com. Mary Ellen has guest blogged on Faith and Family Live, CatholicVote.org, and Catholic Cuisine. She has blogged about the occult and the New Age at AmazingCatechist.com. She's been a guest on Relevant Radio, Radio Maria, several podcasts, and EWTN's Sunday Night Live. Currently, Mrs. Barrett is a marketing consultant and magazine editor for Seton Home Study School, and Mary Ellen speaks and writes on issues pertaining to homeschooling, Catholic family life, marriage, bereavement, and special needs issues. Welcome, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Lisa. It's always great to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyway, we there are so many myths about homeschooling. You know, uh, when you when you first start to homeschool, people ask a lot of strange questions. When they find out you homeschool, even when you're well into your journey and getting a little more confident, you get some pretty weird questions. What are some of the myths that you have tended to run up against? Oh my goodness. It's it's actually amazing how many myths there are and, and that people are still talking about it. What with homeschooling being, being so popular, you know, and so yeah. commonplace. And that's one of the things, one of the myths is that homeschooling is so rare and it's so weird and nobody does that. <laughs> and and it's kind of silly because as you know on our on Long Island, we have a huge Catholic homeschooling mm -hmm. group. And there are several big Christian ones, and there's a lot of secular homeschoolers. So it's it's a growing movement, thank God. Um, in 2017, um, it actually, in places where they actually keep track of homeschooling, not every state does, it outpaced public school enrollment by 4%. Wow. Very, yeah, I know. It's, it sounds like not very much, 4%. But when you consider how many millions of children are involved, this is something that is growing and becoming more and more commonplace and natural, parents wanting to be in charge of their child's formative years. It's, so it's not rare. And it's not weird, and it's not illegal. It's legal. <laughs> law. You know, I don't live outside the law ever, <laughs> so it's legal in all fifty states. Um, so it's not this rare kind of thing. Um, so that's a very common thing that people believe is that it's 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 just that kind of weird. Um, you know, you're afraid of the government, and you're holed up in Montana somewhere, um, <laughs> homeschooling your kids. It's not. They're everywhere. Um, homeschoolers are in every state in the union, and and thank God for it that we have the freedom to be able to do that. Yeah, it, it seems like a quintessentially American thing to do when you think about it. Americans have never been. You know, we're joiners in some respects, but we really do have an independent spirit. We like to think for ourselves. Yes, and parents like to be in control of their family life, and, and that's all to the good. Yeah, homeschooling is, is was the norm for so many years, so mm. much a part of, of the history of the world. Uh, you know, government schools really came about with the Industrial Revolution um, to make children employable. They were mm. sent to schools, be, and 
prior to that, children were very highly valued in, in their family unit and they were taught at home and they were also taught how to work. You know, so they became part of the family business or the family or the family farm, and they were actually an integral part of the success of the family. And with the Industrial Revolution, that kind of all went away, and government schooling became the norm. And then, of course, Catholic schooling and, and other kinds of schooling um, uh, grew up out of that. But homeschooling is not a, a new thing at all. It's actually very traditional. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. I mean, this idea that it's super healthy to take your children and age segregate them, give them all a cookie cutter education as if every child has the same gifts and strengths and weaknesses and aspirations, and that they all need to be developed exactly the same way. It really actually, you get more of a sense the more you think about it, that it was a direct outgrowth outgrowth from industrialization because yeah. it starts to look like a factory it does right yes you that's you're institutionalizing your children um so <laughs> and and a lot of us um thanks to a bunch of pioneers in the movement didn't want to do that and now we we don't have to thank god mm -hmm. um, and that just leads to another myth is that um you, they have to be sent to school to have friends or to be well socialized mm. and um that's actually two different things socialization and having friends because when your child is well socialized and i kind of steal this from um maureen whitman who i know you know very very well and she is yeah. a homeschooling rock star mm. and i heard many years ago at a conference that she spoke at she said um children should be so socialized by the ten commandments and it struck such a chord with me because when people speak of homes uh, socializing, they're usually thinking of the playground and kids have to stand up for themselves and they have to learn to get along and they have, and yes, all those things are absolutely true, but do we have to lock them in a room to learn from their peers how to interact with the world? Is a 10 year old, another 10 year old, the best person to teach your 10 year old how to behave? Of course mm -hmm. not, that's ridiculous. But at home, where the Ten Commandments kind of reign supreme, and the Beatitudes, and the corporal works of mercy, and all of those things that are lived every day. They aren't ideals. They aren't something we read about in a book and check off on a list and take a test and get our sacrament about. It's something that we're actually living mm -hmm. and, and breathing and doing every day. That's how you socialize a child. To see mm -hmm. the, as, as Mother Teresa so wonderfully said, to see the face of Christ in everyone. Mm -hmm. So that when they're, and I'm not saying kids aren't kids, but nobody's committing suicide because they're being bullied. Nobody's mm. being, you know, cut down on social media. Does it happen? I'm sure it does happen. But does it happen with the frequency and the, and the violence that it does in public schools where it seems to be an epidemic? No, because parents are teaching these children virtues and, and love and concern and compassion and the end goal of, of homeschooling, I think, in, in our Catholic world is to get the kids to heaven. Mm -hmm. So all of those things that you just learn in the catechism, we live. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's proper socialization. And that's why, and that's one of the reasons, the main reason why Dave and I started homeschooling. And one of the reasons why most people I know are so happy with the results of mm -hmm. homeschooling. Yeah, um, one of my favorite things to hear about my daughter, who's now almost 20, is even at her age, I have adults expressing surprise to me that she looks them right in the eye, that she's friendly, that she has that sparkle. She's been raised for so, you know several years of her life with people of all different ages and being comfortable being around other adults all the time, not just one teacher for each subject or whatever, but a lot of people from different cultures in terms of their family lives, but also their places of origin and all of that. So she's really had opportunities uh, and to be have more time to just be out in the community being socialized as well, having real world experiences. Right, exactly. And that, that leads into that they'll never have friends or they'll never leave the house. <laughs> I, when people say that, I, I always want to ask them to put gas in my van twice a week <laughs> <laughs> because I spend half my life driving these kids to the things that they do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you drive them somewhere then. <laughs> See how stuck in the house we are at the moment. It, it's because they all have jobs and they volunteer. All of my kids volunteer. Everybody has to do something. And of course, then they have all the fun things that they do. And they they make friends based not because they're, they're all right, here's the 30 people you're going to be locked in a room with for the next eight years. 
but they make friends based on their interests and, and all kinds of things. So some of my kids have friends who are a year or two younger than they are, you know, best friends. Mm. Some of them are friends with people who are older than they are. They all include and play nicely with the young kids. They all enjoy having toddlers around. Um, it, it, there's some such exposure to so many different kinds of people. Like you said, in our own homeschool group, it's a very diverse and eclectic group of people. You know, the, the Catholic homeschool group, what grounds us is we're all Catholic, but there are all kinds of different people and different races and different traditions and different, and it's wonderful. And your children get exposed to all this. Plus they're out, as you said, in the world, volunteering, doing jobs, taking classes, going on um, dual enrollment, going to museum, programs and things like that. They meet people from all over and they make friends very easily because they can look people in the eye and they speak nicely. And I can't tell you how many teenagers you, you go to the supermarket and they're ringing you up and they can't even look at you and they mumble. <laughs> I'm always saying, what? What? <laughs> understand anybody anymore yeah. so it's important that you know when they walk into the house at somebody's house they walk up to the whoever it is mom or dad or say hello thank you for inviting me mm. you know things like that just those little polite nuances that make them social and make it easier for them to make friends mm. that happens because they're with their parents all day Mm -hmm. And they're learning from mom's example. I remember my daughter was about five or six years old and she was having a little birthday party in our little playroom. And one of the mothers came up to me and said, I have to tell you, she was blown away. She said, and this was before we were homeschooling, but we were still spending all of our time together. And she was she was socializing with me a lot. Mm -hmm. And this is speaks to how the family socializes. She came up to me and said, my daughter Brianna was so scared to come to this party because she didn't know anybody else. But as soon as she walked in, Teresa took her by the hand and said, hey, everybody, this is Brianna and started introducing her to the other children. And like, I didn't even know that she had really picked up on that fully. Yeah. Here was my five-year-old. Like there's so much they learn within the home that is just so powerful. And she made that child at home. There's another point I'd like to make, and that is around socialization. We both know Alice Gunther, who wrote a terrific book, A Haystack Full of Needles, all about socialization and homeschooling. And I think that things are rapidly changing because our kids have phones and laptops and things, and we definitely have influences on our homes that homeschoolers didn't used to have that, that really can tip the balance in the wrong way if we're not careful. Sure. But generally speaking, homeschooled kids are more worldly in, in an intellectual sense, have a broader education, have more life experiences, but are yet more innocent in respects that are very healthy for them. Right. I, I like keeping my children innocent for as long as possible. Um, and that's, that's one of those things that people often say. Another myth is that your children will not be exposed to or be aware of the real world. And I always say the real world finds its way in. It always finds its way in. My kids listen to music, they watch movies, they play video games, they do all those things that other kids do, but they do it in age-appropriate ways. And I, and most parents can, ex they expose their children to things as they're ready. Um, Laura Burke was once gave a talk and she said, you wouldn't put an orchid outside, you know, the moment it bloomed, you have to, you know, you bring it out of the hot house for an hour and you put it back in and you bring it out for two hours and, and you expose it to the elements. And that's what we do to our children age appropriately as it's appropriate. You start exposing them to the outside world and it creates a wonderful discussion points around the dinner table as they get older. And in high school, we discuss current events and we discuss issues. It, when they go to college or when they go to a job, they're ready to defend their faith. They're ready to um, be, be present at all these events and know what's going on and, and have the proper context for all of these things. When you send your kids to school, and I hate saying this, but it's, it's true, you're kind of exposing them to other people's not, well, bad parenting, I guess it's bad parenting, I don't know, <laughs> or, or parenting that doesn't agree with your philosophy. Mm -hmm. So that if the kid is allowed to see movies or play video games or, you know, there are naked people on some of these video games, yeah. it's horrifying. Oh, and yeah. they, they all have handheld things that they bring into school. So your kid is going to see this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and, they, mm -hmm. and, and they're not ready for it. So I like my kids to be ready for things. I, and I like to keep them young, innocent young, not, not mm. young babyish young, mm. but I like to preserve their innocence and their virtue for as long as humanly possible. Mm. And I think most people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I really think that's important. We There's such an ethos out there in the culture at large of having our kids keep up. 
mm. with fashions, with points of view, with politics. It's, it's like we're teaching our children to love indoctrination. And, and I don't mean the healthy sense of indoctrination. We indoctrinate our children when we teach them. That's what indoctrination means. But there is a, there's a very persuasive um, kind of indoctrination that happens with the culture that sways them towards thinking of themselves as consumers and really as being virtuous only when they agree. Yeah. I know. I, well, I turned on um, the computer this morning and the first news item that um, came up was about the, uh, the drag queens mm. reading stories in the library to three-year-olds. And, yes. You know, come on. <laughs> just, I mean, those people, it was just the scariest looking thing I've ever seen. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. I don't, it, and people line up to do this. So that's what I say when, when I say you're exposing your children to other people's different parenting philosophies. You really are. For, for six or eight hours a day, this is what mm. they're getting, more than they're getting you. Mm-hmm. So um, I, like I said, the real world finds its way in, and, and, we, and nobody is raising their child at home, educating them at home with the idea that they're going to live at home forever. <laughs> um, I want them all out. <laughs> they have to go. They have to marry nice people and bring me grandchildren. Um, nobody's living in my basement at 30. So the real world is part of our world. It's just hopefully in a more appropriate and, um, and kind of step-by-step manner. Mm-hmm. What qualifies parents to teach their kids, Mary Ellen? We get that shot at us. Oh, well, do you have a degree in teaching? Do you know what you're doing? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says, were you a teacher? No, I was an investment banker. Oh, <laughs> you know, and they look at you like, oh, all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can find my way out of a paper bag. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, what, what, well, first of all, um, it's, it's been proven in many studies that the first five years of a child's life, they learn more than they ever do for the rest of their lives. Mm. And the primary teacher at those times are their parents and mom, mom who's home or dad who's home. Um, they learn to walk. They learn to talk. They learn to, to be polite. They say please and thank you. They learn to share. They learn to take turns. These are all life skills, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Really important life skills that set them up for success for the rest of their lives. When you start teaching a five and six year old to read and to do math, to count their numbers, um, uh, science is growing a bean or looking at a bug or something like that, you can certainly teach them that. Mm-hmm. And once they learn how to read, You've taught them every. You've taught them how to learn. Mm. So I, I always said, like teaching eight kids to potty train was a nightmare. <laughs> teaching a kid to read, it's like a breeze after that. <laughs> Even I've had ones who struggle with reading. Mm. It's it's it becomes a lot easier. And so once they learn to read fluently, you can hand them the science book and say, "Oh, here, okay, you're interested in this. Let's learn about this." And and you're teaching them this idea that they there's nothing they can't do. There's nothing they can't find out. There's nothing they can't learn. Mm-hmm. They have access to more information than any other generation in the world prior to this. Mm-hmm. They can find things out. So, I am qualified to teach my children how to learn. Mm-hmm. And I am qualified to fill that bucket, you know, with fire for learning. Um, I want them to be able to, to follow their interests and to enjoy their life and to enjoy the process of learning. That's really important to me. Can I teach them calculus? I cannot. I absolutely <laughs> cannot. But I can find somebody who can or I can find or they can find somebody who can and I can foster that desire in them to learn more. Mm, Yeah, it's really interesting, too, how much the example of the parents matters. You're teaching your kids to love learning. You're working very hard to provide those learning experiences. And we've got so many. As you mentioned, we've never had more access to, uh, you know, schools online, to homeschool co-ops and things like that. Just so much that's available. Libraries have programs and online programs as well for languages and all sorts of things. So the, the plethora of opportunities to draw from resources other than just mom at home are really just expanding every day. Yep. Um, and I love what you said about filling that bucket with a fire for learning. That is a lifelong gift. To sure. send a child thinking into the world, thinking and inquiring, what a great gift. Yeah. And, and people aren't taught to think in school. They're taught how to spit things out, especially with all this um, testing that I think is just ridiculous the amount of testing that some of these kids take. I get the idea of a standardized test once in a while to see where people fall and if they need extra help. But this idea that entire grades are being taught to a test 
is insane. It just mm-hmm. and it, it mm-hmm. kills the desire for anybody to learn. Mm. It, it, it just doesn't measure what a child can do or what they're worth or their value or anything like that. It just so I, I really believe that it's important to teach them to love learning, to teach them to love reading. Um, not every kid's going to love reading, but to teach them that any they can find out anything mm-hmm. and that they can do anything as long as they're willing to put in the work. That's really, that's my goal in homeschooling, heaven and that, like you can do anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the other thing too that happens at home around the table or while you're driving to an event is how is that process discerned? Hey, you know, you did really well on that. Yeah, I didn't know I could do that. I'm starting to really get interested in this. I didn't think I'd enjoy, you know, this rocket building class or whatever it is. Like just being together and recognizing in our normal conversations day by day through our prayer and worship and, you know, running off to confession and making amends with each other and all of that our children learn how to discern. They learn how to live virtuous lives that help them to reflect more and more their image and like, the image and likeness of God and thereby discover their authentic selves. And that extra time and flexibility that homeschoolers have for them to pursue their passions sends them onto a road of authentically living out of their giftedness and calling in Christ. So true. I love those conversations. Mm. I love the what 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 are you interested in? Oh, I I didn't know I'd be good at this. Oh, well, well, how about this? Why don't we look at this? Why don't we see if we can pursue this further? Or, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And they don't know, so we talk about a bunch of different things. Those are great conversations. This is where you really bond with your children. This is where your your family um, culture is built. You know, mm. and it's wonderful. The family, God intended for the family to be the societal foundation. You know, mm. otherwise the incarnation wouldn't have happened mm-hmm. in a family. You know, he, right. he, he became man in a family. So we know it's so important. It's so important because otherwise God could have come here anyway. You know, in any time, in any way, he came in a family. Mm. And so when you have these conversations all the time, which you're free to do, you're just building that family up and you're building up the kingdom of God. It's so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple of things that, that we also hear are that, um, number one, that our kids can't compete academically and that we're, they're not going to get into college. Like that's a big worry for people when they they hear your their cousin is going to homeschool. It's like, oh, I know it's so crazy. <laughs> um, so many colleges are now recruiting homeschoolers because they're so much more um, independent and capable of work. In my work at um, Seton Seton Home Study School, um, just as a little commercial, they just graduated a young man who was accepted to West Point. Mm. Now that's that's a difficult thing for homeschoolers to do to get accepted into military academies. Um, and see, this isn't the first one they've had do it. Um, they've also had kids go to all the Ivy League schools because they are an accredited program. So it is a little easier when you have the guidance counselor and all that kind of stuff. But lots of people who don't have that have gotten into wonderful colleges. And I think part of the process, part of it, what's good about the freedom of homeschooling is that you have so much freedom to discern what the best college situation for your child is. Mm. Is it an Ivy League? Is it community college? Is it going to work for a couple of years? A lot of them, a lot of kids, as you know, dual enroll. And mm-hmm. so they graduate high school with a semester or two of community college under their belts, thereby saving a ton of money. Oh boy, yeah. Figuring out what they want to do, knocking off some core requirements. A lot of the Seton kids do that. We just had one graduate, um, she graduated at 16 with an, an associate's degree from her local community college and a degree from Seton. Wow. So, I mean, all of these things are possible. And the colleges love homeschoolers. Like they do the work, you know, they, mm-hmm. they think, they raise their hand in class, they argue. Some professors don't care for that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> you're supposed to be learning, so you're supposed to be debating. It's a good thing. And, and I, that's really one myth that is completely, totally debunked, totally debunked. It's even becoming here in New York State easier for homeschoolers to apply to colleges. A few years ago, it was much more difficult. As, as people in our homeschool group are graduating and going to local colleges, the colleges are relaxing the extra requirements for homeschooled students, so, which is a good thing. A very good thing. And some of the statistics that have come out in recent years show that on average, homeschoolers 
test better on standardized tests, even though they've had to learn what it is to step into that system, probably later than kids in a regular school. They have higher admissions to college. And here's a really important one, the higher graduation rates, and they report greater satisfaction in their lives after graduation. Yeah, so, yeah that whole process of self-knowledge and discernment. Yeah, it, it, it helps. They have the freedom to do that. And you have to kind of feel sorry for kids who, who just get pushed along. All right, it's time to take the SAT. It's time to do this. Take this AP. Take this. Now you got to get to the college. You have to apply. And some, some high schools require them to apply for colleges. And, and so you feel this pressure to, to, to do these things when it might not necessarily be what you want or what you're ready for. Mm-hmm. So if you're homeschooled, my, one of my children, my oldest, Katie, finished finish, completely finished her high school year early mm. and was able to discern what she wanted. And what she wanted was to go to a Thomas More uh, College of Liberal Arts in New Hampshire. And she had a wonderful experience because she was ready. Mm-hmm. And she, she did what she had to do and she got ready. Um, I have one who's going to take an extra year. Um, not She's going to finish up high school and take a year to discern what she wants to do because she's not sure and she doesn't want to uh, go into debt or, or take the wrong degree and waste time and money and all that kind of stuff. So, and she's free to do that. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. there's no pressure here in our house, except that you work hard, you have a plan and you lead a good life. You know, you go to mass, <laughs> you're good <laughs> to your family. That's, that's really the, the only pressure that they have. Mm. Beautiful. What about, um, you hear sometimes, don't your teens miss the high school experience, the ball games and the proms and the, all that stuff? What do you say to those parents? My parent, my kids are having a great high school experience. Yeah. <laughs> and all of my children have had the opportunity to go to um, the local uh, Catholic, Orthodox Catholic high school. And they've gotten in, the ones who've take, taken the test, they've, they've been accepted, and none of them have chosen to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I'm kind of a little proud of them for that. They've chosen their own way. Um, they all go to a prom, as you know. When um, homeschoolers want a prom, they have a prom. Mm-hmm. Uh, the difference being that they have it, um, they plan it themselves. They get the insurance certificate. They book the space. They book the DJ. They decorate the gym. They set the dress code. They pick the playlist. Um, there's no debauchery involved in it. <laughs> Uh, there's no nobody's getting arrested <laughs> like that. it's all very kind of wholesome and fun they enjoy themselves I mean they love doing it um they have they go to sports games they play in sports games they do all the things regular high school kids do they just do it from a more home-based place you know um kids who have great gifts for sports their parents find ways for them to play sports there's certainly um no lack of soccer teams in the world and, and baseball, little leagues and things like that. High school sports can be a little bit more challenging, but if a parent has a real desire for a child to achieve that way, they find ways. Um, same thing with music and art. We find ways for this to happen, you know, and certainly there have been many, many, many successful athletes um, who have been homeschooled. Tim Tebow, um, the, the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, uh, the young woman who was the surf, professional surfer, they made a movie about her, the soul surfer lady, mm. um, Michelle Kwan, the skater, mm. and then tons of musicians and artists and, and actors and actresses and, and things like that. I mean, my own daughter was free to um, practice her instruments six hours a day. Her whole high school revolved around the fine arts, and she's studying to be a music teacher on scholarship. Um, was accepted to several conservatories, several high-end conservatories, has played at Carnegie Hall a couple of times. I mean, that wouldn't have happened if she were in school six hours a day. But she had a very, very good high school experience, and she, you know, was out all the time. <laughs> like everybody, all the other kids, they they go to things, they go to dances. Uh, you know, you know how it is. They organize themselves. It's it's very mm-hmm. nice, actually. Yeah, they're real self-starters. That's one of the things that colleges like about them is they're great members of the community. They tend to have honed some of those leadership qualities before they got there, and they have an impact on the culture. They're great independent researchers. They're more socialized. I remember one of our friends went off to college and came home the first day and was like, oh my gosh, they all had their heads in their phones, but I got six phone numbers today. You know, <laughs> she, she just went right in and made them talk to her. It was amazing. Right. Yeah. I, I, I really need you, Mary Ellen, to answer a burning question that I think is in the minds of so many who are just contemplating homeschooling, and it's a big one. Oh, I hope I can answer it. 
this is really important, everybody. Do homeschoolers spend all day in their pajamas? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that one's true. <laughs> in my house, that one's true. I'm sorry. Not everybody is like that, but I walk around some days saying, could you please get dressed? I know you have clothes. Could you please get dressed? <laughs> yes. The, the, the idea being in my house, they say they work better when they're more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I just, I've had to let that one go. It's not a hill I'm willing to die on. But they get dressed when they leave the house. So I've just let that go. <laughs> well, they just all have to start dot coms. That's all. They'll be fine. Um, uh, I'd just like to close with, I know you have a very funny uh, top 10 list of how homeschoolers are weird. Do you want to dive into some of that? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Lisa, can we pause for a yes, second? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. I meant to print it out and bring it here, but okay. So the top 10 reasons why you homeschool. Okay, so number one, your homeschoolers think Jersey Shore is a place to swim and have no idea what Snooky is. <laughs> Number two, when the eight and 10 year old compete to see who can change the baby's diaper faster. <laughs> they enjoy watching the History Channel to point out the historical inaccuracies of the host. <laughs> um, they can't open a locker, but have no reason to lock up their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, when asked to name their 10 favorite songs, three of them are Gregorian chant. <laughs> <Truth>. <laughs> 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 When asked about rock stars, they assume you were talking about Peter, the rock upon which the church was founded. Um, when asked who taught them to read, they say mom rather than Elmo. Mm. They have read books that have never become movies, cartoons, or video games. Mm -hmm. They use their clothing to cover their private parts and not to draw attention to them. Ugh. And the top 10 reason is they think reality television is daily mass on EWTN. <laughs> there you have it, folks. <laughs> top 10 reasons to homeschool. Really, our kids are different. They are a little weird. I taught my daughter early on, if somebody said you're weird, to say thank you. Yeah, weird is good. <laughs> weird is awesome. Marianne, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. Um, it's really been a pleasure as always. Oh, it's been great. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. And folks, stay tuned. We have a three-minute feature coming right up. Hi everyone, this is Chantal Howard from Ideal to Real, making lofty and holy pipe dreams more accessible and attainable. Today I want to offer a creative idea for transforming rosary wars into rosary wins. Let's face it, it is hard, I think that's an understatement, to honor our Blessed Mother's request to pray the daily family rosary. Restless little ones and disgruntled teens and exhausted parents isn't exactly a recipe for harmonious and angelic prayer by any stretch of the imagination. Many times we feel ourselves just gritting our teeth and muscling through. Here's one idea that changed my own childhood experience and is helping my family stay more invested and engaged in the daily rosary. My mother was a brilliant and marvelous woman with a flair for the theatrical. Early on, she realized that the key to keeping us tied in was helping us to discover where we fit into the grand mystical drama of salvation history and how our lives relate to the mysteries of Christ and our Blessed Mother. So she did this by being a master storyteller amidst our family rosary time and teaching us to retell the story in our own words as well. So here's my challenge for you. Begin a new tradition of storytelling while you pray. This is best done by sharing small snippets over top of the person who's leading the first part of the Hail Mary. That way, no additional time is necessary or added into your family prayer time. 
Number one, start by modeling this as a parent. You may want to just use a scriptural rosary guide at first to help everyone become familiar with the biblical narrative. Over time, I invite you to begin telling the story in your own words, adding in your own insights and details, feelings, or emotional insights that you might imagine would be present in the story. Number two, after a season of narrating yourself, invite your children to tell the story. They may be nervous and hesitant at first, but in time, I truly believe you will see them come to life. And before you know it, they'll probably even be bickering over which decade of the mysteries they get to retell, which is a good problem to have. (laughs) Number three, don't criticize when they fumble, skip a Hail Mary, or mistake the characters, or misquote scripture, or even confuse the stories entirely. Chuckle under your breath as the good Lord will do and watch their confidence and personal investment in the mystery of the rosary grow and expand. I hope you find this tip helpful and that you will persevere in becoming master rosary storytellers in your home. Be sure to find me online at Instagram, Facebook, and at my website, chantal-howard.com or at aromarosary.com. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.